anyway, um, he portrayed himself in the lowliest possible occupation, something to do with brick making. So his crown is actually mud that would have been used to make bricks. The arms form a frame, and his titles and his accomplishments are on his apron in cuneiform. Now, he ruled in the city of Ur around 2019 BC. And uh, he said, in the eyes of the gods, the king is a lowly servant. So this is a modest man, and he was very proud of having made the first brick for the foundation of his temple. Now, the cities were first being made or formed at this time, and they were formed around the temple. So his temple had bricks as a foundation stone. Now, we're going to time travel again about 800 years, and here comes this guy. His name is Sepultimanote, and he puts on his stone. King of the universe, strong king, king of Assyria, king of kings, lord of lords, ruler of rulers, in case you didn't get it the first time. And then he puts a curse at the end. As for the one who removes my inscription of my name, may the goddess Ishtar, my mistress, extinguish his sovereignty, break his weapon, cause his manhood to dwindle away, and hand him over to his enemy. So this is Macho Man. But more important than, than what he was is the stone. So this was the foundation stone for his temple. And you can see it's a little fancier than brick. But what it enables us to do is to see that when these people in Iraq used cuneiform, they didn't call it anything. They didn't call it cuneiform. They just used it. But along come people who speak Latin. And they looked at it and they said, oh, it's in the shape of wedge. And wedge in Latin is cuneus. So cuneiform means in the shape of wedges. And so you can see that here pretty clearly, why they said that. Now, at this time, 3500 BC was the first one. And so for a few, maybe a thousand years or so, they used this system. Then along come the Phoenicians and the Greeks and they invent the alphabet that we know and love. Everybody forgot about cuneiform. Nobody knew what it was saying anymore. Until 1850, when a British guy named Rawlinson went to Iraq and he saw the story of Darius told at the side, on the side of a mountain, and he made a mold of it. It was told in three languages. One was Old Babylonian, and so he came in the Rosetta Stone. And then they could translate and they could know what the cuneiform was saying. I would find it very difficult. You can see how small that writing is on the other documents. This one would be a lot easier. Anyway, so that's cuneiform. And um, let's see if I'm leaving anything out. So and just how we got, so you get the first writing, and then we get into uh, alphabet that we know. All right, now the fireplace comes from, guess where? Rome. And the guy over the fireplace, you might recognize, he has a smirking smile and dimples, and he wrote funny, bawdy stories in the Decameron. So it's Boccaccio. Uh, and I just learned that that's bronze. Uh, for some reason, when I was looking at it first, I thought it was marble. But it's a, it's a copy from the, a cenotaph, another vocabulary word that I learned. So a, a kind of a, a piece like that exists near where Boccaccio is buried. So that's who that is. Now on the other side, we have a lot of jewelry from the Middle Ages. And they were collected by a guy named Eugene B. Thor. He's very generous with his library. He died last December. And very nice, and, you know, just a super generous man. But if we look through, we're not going to look at that, but if we look through and see the gold earrings, the loop, there's some modern that could belong to Beyonce. You see the ones I'm talking about? All right. And this uh, statue of Cupid comes from the eruption of Vesuvius. That's why he has a few lumps and bumps. And I think that since we're going to see the front cover of something, we'll look at that picture in a minute. But before we do that, anybody wonder how you get up to the balcony? There's no ladder. So if you look over here, you see this bump out piece? And look at the bookcase behind it. See it has a handle on it? Yep. So if you pull that handle, the whole bookcase swivels. And it would have bumped up against the edge of the balcony. So they had to add on a little place to accommodate that. 
and behind there is a big staircase. And it serves this room and the library. But it's just a big marble staircase. You know, it sounds so exciting or mysterious, but that's what it is. Now, since we're here, and since we're going to see the front cover, I want you to take a look at this. This is the back cover of the Lindau Gospels, one of the um, prized possessions of the library. And Morgan received a telegram in code telling him that it was coming up for auction. And he just said, go, get it. And he was so happy to have succeeded in bidding for it that he made it number one, M1, in his collection of manuscripts. He has 1,600, and this is number one. So this is the back cover, and you can see that the nuns on the border of Switzerland put this all together. You see how they had to use different pieces for each side, because they had to use whatever they had. Now, looking at the whole thing, you see a cross. That's easy, right? But let your eye make something else of the four negative spaces. Can you see a butterfly? Mm -hmm. All right, the butterfly is a symbol of resurrection. And so the message is that Christ defeated death on the cross. So, and there's a, a gem in each quadrant, but the only one that's original is that one. So they fixed it up. But this is 100 years, at least 100 years older than the front cover. And they had to make it fit because it wasn't exactly the same size. But you'll be impressed with the front cover. And you'll, I just want you to have this in the back of your well, mind. What's the date approximately? Oh, this is like, the other one's 800, so this must be 700. Mm -hmm. Seven. And that's the back? Like ninth century, so 800. That's the back. the back. And the other one's ninth century. Yeah, this is the back cover. Eighth century. Eight ninth century, so it's 800 something. All right, let's go into the library. by this wonderful Italian family who get very little credit for what they've done in the United States and elsewhere. The name was Picturelli, and they carved like the statue of Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial. They did the one at Central Park. They did these, and um, they, were, they mostly worked in stone, but anyway, they did these, and they used medallions as the portraits. And there are 10 men and two women, right? Some popes and the princess from the. Oh, and I might as well tell you that Morgan and the architect had nicknames for each other. Morgan's nickname was Lorenzo the Magnificent. <laughs> and Lorenzo the Magnificent had built the library in Florence, so it was appropriate. The architect was called Bramante because that was the Renaissance architect. So the whole place is all about the Renaissance. All right, let's go into the library. 